So when you look at human teeth, clearly our incisors are designed for cropping and peeling fruit. And people say, well, what about my canines? What about these? And I'm like, what about your canines? <laughs> the human canines have become modified incisors. They're small, they're rounded, they act like incisors. They are useless for ripping open anything other than an envelope. But they are absolutely uh, uh, of no use in trying to eat meat. Our molars slide across each other horizontally in the typical fashion of an herbivore. You see that the human jaw joint has moved to a position above the plane of the cheek teeth, giving our jaw, lower jaw this L shape, just like all the other herbivores. And the major muscles operating the lower jaw, again, are the masseters and the pterygoids. All right, so everybody, put your hands right here and bite down. You feel that muscle popping out? That's the masseter. Pterygoids are on the inside. They hold the lower jaw in a sling-like arrangement, move it back and forth uh, uh, and frontwards and backwards to help you grind your food. And this is just a comparison showing you whose jaw yours look like. You can see, just like the horse. My, by the way, horses have small canines just like we do. Um, expanded angle of the mandible, jaw joint above the plane of the cheek teeth. Our jaws look nothing like that of the wolf or the carnivore. So just stop it with all this nonsense about, oh, I'm a carnivore. No, you're not. And you can keep playing those games, but you're going to pay for it with heart attacks and cancer and other diseases. Uh, we have well-developed facial muscles, walled and oral cavity, fleshy lips, which I know you thought the purpose of our lips was for kissing. That's a fringe benefit. The real purpose is to help us move food into our mouths. Uh, our cheek muscles help us in chewing. And the temporalis muscle, which sits up here in humans, is almost vestigial, does next to nothing. Uh, this is an inside view of the human oral cavity, and you can see the pterygoid is right here. It's opposite the, uh, uh, the masseter, and uh, importantly, the parotid uh, salivary gland, which sits right in front of your ear, is the salivary gland that makes the enzyme salivary amylase, which starts breaking down carbohydrate as you're chewing your food. Our tongue is very thick and muscular, helps in uh, chewing our food, but it also helps in speech. And what's also really interesting is that because of the structure of the human pharynx, uh, meaning this part of uh, um, our throat, we almost certainly have a much wider and broader range of, of taste and flavor perception than any other animal because no other creature on this planet has the same pharynx structure. And most of what we perceive as taste and flavor comes not from the tongue, but actually from um, smell molecules that travel back down the throat into, uh, oh, excuse me, I had that exactly backwards, that travel from the food that we're chewing up into the uh, olfactory uh, cavity or the nose, and it's what uh, uh, the uh, perception of those flavor molecules that we are tasting. That's why when you have a bad cold, you can't taste your food. As I've already said, esophagus is very narrow. Muscular uh, should only be handling soft, chewed plant foods. Most of the people who choke to death choke on meat. Uh, people who are suffering from uh, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease or super bad uh, uh, heartburn, uh, it's usually because they're eating food, diets that are high in meat and fat and untreated that can lead to cancer. The human stomach is small, uh, is only moderately acidic with food, uh, only holds about 25% of the entire gut capacity. In order to get enough calories to uh, sustain us, we have to, like all herbivores, batch feed, meaning we have to eat multiple meals over the course of the day to survive. Um, and the average adult human consumes about 5.4, 5.5 pounds of food, and that's about 3.3% of our body weight. And because of the small capacity of our stomach and our inability to dead rotting tissue, uh, we can't extract 
energy from a carcass the way carnivores can. That's why hunting for us is a waste of time. You exp um, when humans go out to hunt in Stone Age societies without refrigerators and freezers, they would expend all of this energy chasing an animal, and they could only extract a very small amount of calories from that animal before the body became inedible. So that's a waste of time. And that's why it was really the women who had kept us alive as, as a species. You know that, right? In Stone Age society, 80% of the calories consumed come from the gathering efforts of women. What the men, uh, 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 first of all, most of the time the men go out to hunt, they come home empty handed. And what they do bring back doesn't really supply uh, very much from a, nutri a nutri nutritional standpoint. So my theory is that hunting was invented by women. <laughs> now, why would I say that? Well, think about it. No, think, think, think about it. Men who, who go out to hunt, they hang out with other guys, they spend all day chasing stuff they never catch, and then they come home tired and appreciative for the food that their wives provide. Whereas if they're sitting at home doing nothing, they could be out chasing you know what. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, hunting is not efficient for humans. And I got a bunch of slides that actually go into greater detail, but I really can't, we don't have time to, 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 to uh, uh, review that. Uh, just, this is really like a two-hour lecture that's been compressed into one. And quite frankly, this topic I could do a whole 10-day conference on this design question all by myself. It is that, there's that much information to be learned. But we're, get, we're just kind of doing the, uh, the real uh, uh, important points here. And when you graft mammals out, they fall on three, uh, along three, three lines. When you graft body size versus absorptive area, they're the uh, 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 fallivores or animals that eat foliage. The faunivores, uh, these are the animals that eat other animals. And then the frugivores, those that eat the uh, uh, fruit or high energy uh, plant foods. And then when you uh, look at human body size versus absorptive area, we are clearly on the frugivore uh, 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 graft. But we do have adaptations <clears throat> in our uh, intestines that have equipped us to, to eat more green leafy uh, type plants. Human small intestines, extremely long for an animal our size, is about 30 to 35 feet. Remember I said for herbivores, it's 10 to 12 times body length. You might say, wait a minute, I'm six foot tall. So I have a small intestine that's 30 feet. That's not 10 times. Yes, it is, because body size is me measured head to tailbone, not head to uh, toe. And the average uh, torso length in human beings is two and a half to three feet, classic proportions. But it's uh, even better because the small intestine is compressed like an accordion. And then when you look at the mucosa, it's thrown up in these little finger-like projections. And then when you look on the surface of those, you see they have uh, what are called microvilli. The enzymes lining our small intestine are a mixture of carbohydrate, protein, and fat-digesting enzymes. And I'll just tell you a little anecdote. When I was doing my um, gross anatomy in medical school, our cadaver was a little lady who was five foot four. And when we removed her small intestine and stretched it out across the room, it was 32 feet long. So yeah, we have the classic proportions of a, a plant eater. And then you look at our accessory organs of digestion, the liver, pancreas, gallbladder. Uh, liver is responsible uh, for manufacturing bile. Bile is stored in the gallbladder. Uh, and uh, what does bile do? Bile is a detergent. It emulsifies the fat, which allows us to absorb it into our bloodstream. All the blood that's drained from the digestive tract passes through the liver before it gets into the general uh, uh, circulation, and the liver detoxifies anything that could cause a reaction and modifies these uh, dietary components so that they're useful to the body. And then it also extracts things from the bloodstream that ultimately get excreted in the feces. The pancreas is responsible for uh, manufacturing the uh, enzymes that digest the food that we eat. So it makes proteases, which dig digest proteins, lipases, uh, which uh, break apart fats, and then the amylases, which digest starches. And also, uh, the pancreas has beta cells, which manufacture insulin that helps to control blood sugar. So you have what I call phase one, enzymatic digestion. Um, bile, as I said, emulsifies fat and cholesterol. They are absorbed and then either get deposited in fat cells or burn for energy. Um, your pancreatic enzymes, you have five different proteases which recognize different 
uh, uh, bonds amongst the various amino acids, and with the five different proteases, you're able to break apart every protein into its constituent amino acids. Importantly, each enzyme recognizes and breaks apart a specific type of what are called peptide bonds. Those are the ones that join amino acids together. Animal and plant proteins differ only in the relative proportions of amino acids and protein structure, not in the types of bonds. All animal proteins and all plant proteins are made up of the same 20 amino acids, just in differing proportions. So you can think of it like a ship, a car, a washing machine, and an airplane are all made out of metal. It's just how that metal is put together determines what you end up with. Same thing with the proteins. Lipases, <coughs> excuse me, uh, breaks apart the uh, triglycerides into free fatty acids, and amylases breaks down starches. Well, then you get to phase two, or fermentation, uh, and that's where uh, the bacteria in the microbiome act on the leftover fiber to break it down. Now, why am I showing you fossilized poop? It's because I want you to understand that this paleo craze is a bunch of bull, okay? When you actually look at what the people who are, li who are alive during Paleolithic times left behind for us to see, it was poop that was full of fiber. These people were eating 100 to 150 uh, grams of unprocessed fiber per day. They weren't eating uh, uh, meat because they couldn't catch meat. And they certainly couldn't eat dead, rotting corpses because they would have poisoned themselves. They were eating plants. So the true paleo diet is a plant-based diet. This crap that people are doing is nonsense, and that's why studies show that people who eat paleo diets are more likely to end up dead. Uh, this is a quote from a book called Topics in Dietary Fiber. It says, the role of dietary fiber in pre-agricultural subsistence economy of early human populations strongly suggests that for over 99% of human existence as a distinct species, our gastrointestinal tract was exposed to the selective pressures exerted by coarse, high-residue diet of plant tissues. I kind of took the sexism out of that quote. So when you look at our colon, it's extremely long, has the typical pouch structure of uh, herbivores, has an appendix, which is only found in plant-eating uh, animals. The primary functions are water absorption, breaking down uh, leftover fiber into the short-chain fatty acids, uh, which uh, uh, improve our physiology, produces some vitamins, 